Hey guys, welcome again to Barry's A Track and Classic Car Radio Repair. And uh, this uh, this video is uh, going to be on the subject of grounding. Uh, I just kind of felt like I'm in the mood to 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 explore some areas of grounding and uh, explain. Uh, first of all, I'm going to dispel a very popular myth about grounding. Um, but uh, before we do that, um, I'm going to mention uh, kind of a happy note in, uh, in my business life and professional life is uh, because I now spend a good 12 hours a day in, in the chair that I sit at the bench at working on units, uh, in order to prevent problems like my legs falling off from lack of circulation, I finally invested in a $300 office chair that I can actually sit Indian style in this thing and uh, be relaxed and be at the perfect angle without having to lean forward or backward, just be completely relaxed while I work. Uh, it's very much uh, has made a difference in my uh, fatigue level, my ability to spend long hours at the bench at overnight, usually, uh, God, sometimes, it's not really all that terribly unusual to have a 24-hour shift in this shop, but just depending on deadlines and stuff like that. But anyway, so uh, when I do need to take a little uh, break, um, I just flip the lever here, and then I'm just like, uh, whoop, I was already had a flip in this position where I can just, okay, come on, phone. There we go. Uh, I can just kick back and just watch my little TV here for a good couple of minutes. But um, this is a pretty informal video, so I'll just stay in this relaxed mode for for a while. Um, one of the uh, most popular myths about grounding is that if you're in a, if you're in a car and you get struck by lightning, you're safe because your car is grounded. Okay, you probably are safe, and your car as far as the lightning is concerned, is effectively grounded. But your car is not actually grounded. Uh, it's being held up on four points by 12 inches of air and rubber. So it c your car cannot possibly be grounded. The only way your car could be truly grounded is if your part jammed up against a metal building that is grounded. And that's how your car can be truly grounded. But now the reason that your car is grounded as far as a lightning bolt is concerned is because this lightning bolt is traveling you know from you know thousands of feet up um, and it can't even uh, it cannot even make the reach until it knows it can make a strike basically uh, any type of electricity uh, cannot even begin to travel until it has a destination uh, and uh, a pretty much kind of a pre-programmed way to meet that destination. Uh, in the case of a lightning bolt, it's usually uh, a, a trail of ionized air that is created when the lightning starts to get their strength and it finds a high spot uh, that's a pretty good conductor to ground and you know a, a trail of ionized air begins to form because of the potential and that's what gives the lightning a, basically a path but um, after traveling that kind of distance from the sky uh, the 12 inches that separates your bumper from your from the earth is not going to stop that bolt uh, it's traveling that far it could be millions of watts and it's going to jump right across that it's just going to jump right across that 12 to 18 inches of space between the, the between your bumper and the ground so that's why your car is effectively grounded during a lightning strike and that's why you're most likely going to be safe during a lightning strike is because uh, you uh, are only basically on one side of the circuit you're not completing the circuit the car is completing the circuit uh, via its tendency to arc to ground when st when struck by lightning, so that myth is is dispelled. And there wasn't any real purpose in explaining that myth. Uh, it's just something that's bothered me because I am a technical guy and I'm into the the fine detail of everything. And uh, the car is not truly grounded, so you know people thinking that it is grounded, you know, could be misleading. So anyway, uh, let's move on here to the subject of grounding. Uh, now another. Uh, area of uh, interest in the area of grounding is in the house wiring. What's the difference between the neutral wire and the ground wire? Um, you know, if they're reversed at the outlet, everything will still work as it, as it normally does. Um, you know, if you disconnect the neutral wire and, and connect the neutral part of the circuit to ground instead, it's going to work. So, you know, why would the ground and the neutral be separate things? Well, yeah, it, it is. It, it was a little mysterious until I did a little research myself. Uh, but uh, the, the basic thing to remember is that the neutral wire, uh, while it's at supposedly negative, you know, or zero 
zero voltage potential it is still carrying the current back that was delivered by the hot wire uh, you know the current comes from the hot wire goes through your device it needs to be returned to the source somehow to complete the circuit so that's what that's where your neutral wire comes in your neutral wire is basically uh, neutral it's not hot you know so to speak uh, but it is current carrying whereas earth ground is not is not meant to be the current carrying so what your earth ground is in effect is basically a backup system in case your neutral fails then your earth ground will provide the path for the current to return but now your earth ground is not really meant to be a current carrying device so uh, at any rate uh, your your hot and your neutral will be connected together in your main panel but not at any of the sub panels at the sub panels the uh, the neutral and the ground ha cannot be connected together they must remain separated and it, it goes back to this current routing deal that happens if the neutral should fail and then of course your ground is also a safety uh, a safety feature uh, your earth ground is a safety feature not all chassis ground is necessarily a safety feature uh, in the 80s they had a lot of solid state TVs that had what they call a hot chassis um, as long as it's inside the TV and, uh, and the customer can't touch it it's not going to hurt anything for the chassis of a certain circuit to be at plus 80 volts as its ground and all the ground points in that circuit will connect to that plus 80 volt point and the circuit will work just fine in its own little world because it's not interfacing with the other circuits in that in in the power sort of way you know circuit uh, it's passing signals to and from different circuits but it's not necessarily sharing the power supply with another circuit and naturally uh, any circuit that has an a hot chassis is what they call it um, you know is is not going to be you know accessible to the outside world uh, all that's going to be accessible to the outside world ideally and required by underwriters laboratories is the true earth ground potential which is basically zero volts um, that that's your safety that, that that's your safety device there that's your guaranteed zero volt potential you know as long as you're touching that with all of your body and you're not touching hot you're safe uh, and maybe even if you're touching hot only you're still safe uh, naturally you don't want to be touching hot and ground or hot and neutral at the same time because the current will then flow through your body so blah 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 you guys know all the rest of the stuff that I was about to spew for so now let's move on to a piece of equipment that I use to test uh, the, the safety of the ground the integrity of the ground uh, now this doesn't usually apply uh, with it certainly doesn't apply with a car eight track player because uh, a car eight track player doesn't have the safety issues that your your house wiring does your 120 and your in your 240 uh, this is basically what they call a high pot tester high pot is short for high potential and uh, the reason that the for the high potential is that uh, this thing tests the integrity of your safety ground in any piece of equipment that has a, a, a grounded chassis and uh, what this does is now most stereo equipment I've seen and even most of your test equipment that I've seen um, use, uses number 14 wire as the main power cord so uh, number 14 wire is only capable of carrying I, th I think 15 amps uh, so this thing's running uh, 25 to 30 amps through it uh, through your ground system so what it's basically trying to do it's trying to burn out uh, basically uh, a questionable ground connection and so if the uh, if your ground connection is not good solid and tight and capable of carrying this full 25 amps of current which in actual operation it would never ever have to carry and in fact in most pieces of equipment uh, most pieces of equipment don't even pull more than about three or four amps so you know uh, running 25 amps through the equipment safety ground system is like super super overkill safety testing so uh, naturally I am big into having uh, you know all kinds of cool stuff uh, I basically have a factory in the house let me see if I can find a quick overall view of the bench 
uh, just to give you, there you are. Th this is just the vents. This is not including the stuff on my left side, my audio system, my c my 32 camera switching system. This is just the test equipment that's right in front of me here. So um, as you can see, I'm I'm very much into having all the p the exact right stuff uh, to do you know the complete service with. So now let's move back to our little. Um, well, first, let's move back to my face just so I can kind of keep my bearing where I'm at. Hi, Barry. Here I am again. Now let's move on to my back to my high pot tester. And what we're going to do here is, well, first of all, um, I just got this from eBay uh, not too long ago, and I had to make my own little probe for it. Uh, this kind of stuff, um, you can always find it usually, you know, pretty pretty cheap uh, as long as you're willing to do some some maintenance on it and calibrate it and stuff. Uh, and you can find the service manual, which is usually uh, available for free online, like this one was. And I, well, I had to make a, a 25 amp grounding cable uh, as the main source of uh, uh, power transfer from the the ground connector to the device under test. So um, this thing has what the is normally uh, called a banana plug. This is a, a four millimeter banana plug. It's uh, pretty much the standard uh, for equipment that does not use BNC connectors. This is what they usually use. Like your multimeters use banana plugs for your for your connectors to the meter. Well, this is a banana plug as well, but this is more than this is right about twice the size of the thing. Uh, a brief search online, I'm probably never going to find an actual nine millimeter banana plug. I found some hints. You know how you. Uh, you, you, you throw something at Google and says, oh, yeah, I found it. But you go on the website and it's, you know, you don't even know where they found the reference to it. But so that was the case with this. Uh, so what instead, I, I had to kind of do a little thinking here. Uh, what can I use that's going to fit snugly into this 9 millimeter opening, um, you know, and, and be able to clamp onto it, something that's nice and solid but still be, uh, you know, something that would fit really snugly into this might be a little bit too dense to try to solder onto. Uh, probably a huge copper post would work. But anyway, uh, I was kind of uh, wanted to find a solution pretty quickly, so I just did. Uh, let me grab a different camera view here, see if we can find. Um, oh, I think this is probably a good camera angle to look at this one from. Okay, this is the the little probe that I end up making. Uh, now this is basically just, um, you might recognize this, this is just basically a cut off uh, paddle type drill bit, you know, like a one inch paddle bit, has that little hex uh, shaft on it, so you just, you know, I just grind that puppy off, and then I uh, lock this into one of these little aluminum couplings that's designed to couple, uh, you know, two ends of say numbers, number two or number three cable, you know, big old heavy house supply cable. Uh, so I uh, I got one end of that uh, cutoff bit locked into one end of this coupler here, and then of course the other end I just clamped onto a piece of a uh, number 10 stranded wire. And uh, now number 10 stranded wire, uh, I need uh, 30 amps. This ampere it's 25 amp tester, but the amp but the ammeter goes with the 30 amps, so I pretty much needed 30 amp capacity wire. Number 10 stranded wire, our solid wire, is capable of 30 amps capacity, so that takes care of my uh, my uh, heavy duty industrial quality test cable. And then uh, for the clamp, I just picked up a 30 amp, your basic uh, cheap 30 amp clip here. Um, I really find it hard to believe that this thing can really, in actual practice, handle 30 amps. Uh, doesn't have a whole lot of whole lot of grip. Are a whole lot of surface area, but at any rate, I did find out that it works well enough. It, it actually, even better than the factory cable that came with the unit. So we'll go back to the, our uh, view of the front of the unit. We'll go ahead and plug in our power cable here that that I made, and it fits nice and snugly into that, very nicely. And as it wears, it'll just push further in to make even better contact. And now the way that we test this unit to make sure that the unit itself is in proper working order is we ground this cable to its own chassis. And here we go. Now, according to the manual, um, I did set up and calibrate this unit. Um, it wasn't real hard to calibrate. It only required standard test equipment that I've got. Um, and it calibrated just beautifully and pretty well precisely. And so now we're going to... Uh, basically, what we're going to do we're going to uh, we're going to test the units, make sure that it works like it's supposed to, uh, but we're also going to measure the resistance of this cable I made, which, according to the manual, the cable that they supply with the unit is supposed to be, uh, let's see, 0 0.01 ohms, which is 
one hundredth of an ohm. That's an extremely low resistance. Uh, their cable is supposed to be one hundredth of one ohm. So let's go ahead and fire this thing up. I'm going to zero zoom in on the meter series so you can see what's happening. So what happens here, I'm going to press it's the start button to start the test. It's going to feed 30 amps through this cable to the chassis and it's going to measure, it's going to use that heavy current to get a true resistance reading on the uh, on, on just this cable here because we're just connecting to the machine and testing the resistance of the cable. So let's go ahead and hit the test button or start button. We're drawn by 30 amps. And you can see my resistance uh, is only about um, half of what the uh, resistance of this factory supply cable would be. So my cable actually makes much better contact. Mine is a better cable, a heavier duty cable making better contact. It's only half the resistance of the factory cable. So that's a pretty cool thing there. Let's, uh, let's see if I can get an exact reading on that. Let's see one major tick mark would be one hundredth of an ohm so half of that would be one two hundredth of one ohm so that's what my cable is measuring one two hundredth of one ohm so that's a good uh, in a couple more seconds it'll finish the test and it's measuring okay now let's see what happens when we when we don't have a good ground when we don't have a proper ground connection we're going to remove our we'll, we'll, we'll remove the ground connection during the test and we'll show you what happens there Okay, test. And there we go. We got a fail. And even if that ground is restored, that fail condition stays in place until I hit the reset button. Okay, so we got a definite failure there. So now we're going to uh, test it once again with the ground properly in place. Make sure the machine's working right. Everything's cool. Okay. Give it about uh, three, four more seconds, and it'll finish the test. Okay, and now we're going to actually test uh, a piece of equipment I've got. I've just got my little one of my heat guns here. This is my huge heat gun. That's uh, This is a 1500 water, big old heat gun. And uh, I'm just going to measure, I'm just going to make sure that the ground on this is good. Now, of course, this is uh, my cable plus this big old long power cord that goes to this thing plus the distance that the electricity goes through on its way to the exposed metal right here which is what we're we're, what we're after we want to make sure that this exposed metal is properly grounded because this is the part that we can touch without uh, taking the unit apart so what we're going to do here is we're going to plug this unit in like this we're going to clamp our ground probe onto the exposed metal of my heat gun here doesn't matter whether the heat gun's on or off because it's only measuring the ground integrity. And so uh, we're just about ready to turn this thing on here and, uh, and measure everything. And uh, you know what? While we're doing that, uh, this thing does run 30 amps. And this little, this little clip here, like I said, it's not a lot of contact area. The exposed metal on my blower is a little bit, little bit corroded and discolored, so we're probably not getting a, a really great connection. And that means running 30 amps of current, we're probably going to generate a little bit of heat. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this thing. And uh, we'll zoom my temp meter in on the clip and see if we can get everything in the camera here. All right, there we are. You can just see the temp reading about 80. Let's see if I can go a little farther away, closer to the camera here. Okay, about like that. Okay, reading about... 82, very solid, about 82. So we're going to hit the test, and we're going to see if that temperature climbs a degree or two. Let's let's get my aim back on this thing, right? Okay, now we're reading about 76, 75, 76. Let's hit the test. We may need to cycle it a couple of times to get that temperature to climb. We'll go ahead and cycle it again. Now we're starting to climb. I guess we weren't. <laughs> okay, now we're starting to climb a little bit. 76 and a half, 77. We'll go ahead and hit it again. Let it heat up a little bit more. 78. So it's not climbing a whole lot, but it, it is climbing. We're, we're running a lot of current through the little contact point there. Now 
are getting close to 80. It's taking me a little while to find the, the hot spot, but it's generally where the weakest part of the connection will be because that's where, where you're gonna have your resistance, which allows your heat to develop. So yeah, we're getting around to 82, around that spot. By 84. Okay, so yeah, we can we can see, and I can probably reach it. And it's, oh yeah, it's it's noticeably warmer. Yeah, it's 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 definitely warmer. Okay, so that was just a quick a little demonstration of uh, my hot pot my hot pot tester. This will be uh, found in most of your factories. You very seldom find them in repair shops. They're they're not really considered necessary. I mean, it, it's easy enough to test your ground connection or to even look at it. I mean, ground connections are usually pretty tight, but you know, um, what the heck? I mean, why not have the same gear they use at the underwriters' laboratories to certify the safety of the equipment? Um, it's just an extra measure of safety, extra measure of security for the customer. Uh, you know, it makes my shop look a little bit better, and uh, it's, I'm just kind of a test equipment fanatic, and I just uh, believe in having all the all the right stuff. So now, uh, now that we're on the subject of um, grounding, uh, this also has a little bit to do with insulation in integrity. And needless to say, you know, if the unit's in a really moist and salty environment, uh, that could eventually impregnate the insulation. Uh, next thing you know, you got insulation breakdown, which allows leakage, and um, and you you know you could have problems. So, since we're on the subject of uh, of insulation, I'll uh, show you another cool tool I've got. Hope I don't need to test, stretch my mic cord. Yeah, I gotta take my phones off for just a moment here. This other little piece of gear I have is uh, is also meant to test uh, insulation integrity of one form or another. Uh, let's see if we can get a different camera, uh, different camera on here. Let's see, maybe this one right here. Okay, what happened there? We are missing a camera somehow. Try this again. There we are. Okay, uh, this instrument. Let's see if we can get a better. Uh, Try. I really need to be able to hold this down because I have to have to crank this thing pretty hard. I'm trying to get a good camera angle. Uh, let's see what happens when we try the overhead cam. Is this anywhere close? Nope, it's really not anywhere close. So that one's not really going to do us much good. So okay, we'll just uh, refocus a different camera, I guess. Well, maybe let's try this one. Okay, that camera. Uh, is not okay. Let's try camera 16. My my fault. Sorry, guys. All right, let's see. This uh, this will probably work. Okay. Just need to move up a little bit. So we will dismantle this for the moment and just kind of move it back a little bit. Give us more room to see what we're doing. Okay, this cool little device is called a Megger, uh, and uh, basically it is a uh, it's a device that measures resistance in the very high range, mega ohm range. Uh, most of your digital multi readers, mul digital multimeters, uh, they'll measure resistance up to 20 mega ohms. That's 20 million ohms. That's way higher than is really considered practical for any any real use. Uh, you know, uh, solid state equipment doesn't use you know, much past, say, 100K in resistance. Even your tube equipment with its high impedances, you know, you don't see stuff, you know, much past 10 mega ohms in a tube radio, if even that. Well, this thing will measure uh, up to 100 mega ohms. The way that it uh, is, can be that sensitive is it generates a, a pretty high voltage. Uh, and this thing has a built-in little crank. It doesn't use any batteries or plug-in. It's got its own little built-in generator. and uh, if you put your fingers, if you, if you just touch the ends of these wires onto your finger while you start to crank this thing, uh, you immediately feel quite a shock. I'm just going. 
just for fun. I'm going to give myself just a little shock just to see if I can remember it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, yes. This thing, I'll, and let's go ahead and measure this thing. I don't currently have my multiplexer in the circuit where I can get uh, a f three or four different camera angles, but let's just see if we can get the multimeter in on the scene. Uh, that would be probably camera six. Okay, there's our multimeter. And I'm just going to connect this multimeter to the output of this of this Omega. And I'm going to crank up the generator, and we should get about 500 to 550 volts. Okay, so we're going to be measuring probably AC voltage because it is a generator. Generators don't produce DC until it's rectified and filtered. Uh, let's see, voltage, AC volts, let's put it in the 2000 range. Alrighty, let's start cranking this puppy and see what we can get this voltage up to. Okay, something's not right here. It should be getting much higher than that. So let's just see what we got wrong here. Maybe this does have a rectifier and filter. Okay, so yeah, this thing's putting out 540 volts DC. And I'll show you, uh, I'll give you an overall view of what I'm doing here. Okay, now you probably can't see the meter, but you can see me cranking this thing. And right now we're at about 535. 540 volts. Crank it real slow. It goes down to about 100, 120, 120, 30 volts. Okay, so anyway, what it's doing here is uh, now we're going to focus on the on the meter. Find the camera that I'm using here. Probably this one. Okay, this is our little meter. Now, one thing you'll notice about this meter is it doesn't have a spring action that returns it to zero. Um, you know, if you allow it to waver, if you allow it to, w if, it's, if it wanders, you know, to a reading, it tends to stay there. Well, there's a, a reason for that. It doesn't really need to, ha to be mechanically returned to zero because the moment you start cranking it, that is without anything connected to it, the moment you start cranking it, it zeroes itself out, see. Like that, it just—it's kind of like an electronic, electric, equi electro equilibrium type thing that zeroes itself out. Now it is currently generating 500 and something volts, and now what we're going to do is we're going to measure. We're going to we're going to grab a couple of really high value resistors. And we're going to measure uh, and see what kind of accuracy this thing's capable of. Uh, and like when we're measuring, if I grab it, say a 10 ohm, re if I if I grab a a 20 mega ohm resistor and it reached 20 mega ohms, that means that um, if I were measuring resistance, 20 mega ohms is a pretty low value of resistance uh, for installation. So, that would, rep so that, that would suggest that the installation is starting to break down. If I was reading just, say, 20 mega ohms or even 10 mega ohms uh, on, a, on a piece of wire compared to an installation. So let's just go grab a couple resistors here. I'll be right back. Okay, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, resistors in the tens of mega ohms are just not used <laughs> in an audio shop, uh, and so uh, I have basically anything one mega ohm and above in in the same box is just they're they're just all piled in here, uh, all different values. So let's just arbitrarily select. Let's uh, let's select a 5.6 mega ohm. And there's no need to pull it off the reel. Um, all I got to do is just connect. A, well, okay, here's one. It's already partially off the reel. So we'll just connect this one up. This is a 5.6 mega ohm resistor. So what we're going to do, we're going to crank this thing up and see what that meter ends up reading. Okay, on a 5.6 mega ohm resistor, 5.6 mega ohms is going to end up being right about there. So let's go ahead and crank this thing up. Okay, now something's not looking right here. Uh, 
Okay, this is not a 5.6 mega ohm. The color code says it is. It's really kind of hard to tell, actually. Um, so you know what? Just for fun, let's go ahead and measure it with the with the, with the digital multimeter and see what it's supposed to be. See what it really is. Let's see. So we're going to be measuring resistance in a 20 mega ohm range. The double jeopardy resistance is. 0.96 mega ohms, one right at about one mega ohm. It says. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, one mega ohm is going to be right about there. There's your your one mega ohm mark. So let's go ahead and crank it up again. Okay, and as we can see, if this thing were, were able to stay still somehow, it would. Uh, it would be pretty well right on one mega ohm. Oop, let's get a little closer to the camera. And here's our one mega ohm mark right there. And you see it's hovering right there about the one, right around the one mega ohm. It's a very accurate little machine. It's running 500 volts through a mega ohm of resistance and reading just perfectly. Okay, so we'll try another resistor. It's quite a tolerance on that last uh, on that last resistor there. Maybe I just pulled it off the wrong reel. Didn't know uh, what I was reading. Okay, let's try. Uh, see if we can find a 10 mega ohm in here somewhere. Doesn't matter if I lose any or misplace them because I'll never use them anyway. Okay, well, a lot of these tapes are worn off. Color codes are the Japanese type that I'm not real familiar with. So let's, uh, let's measure the actual resistance of this resistor here. This resistance is measuring at okay two point oh about two point two point five mega ohms looks like okay so all right got a two point five mega ohm resistor hooked up. 2.5 mega ohms is going to be just above where the needle is now. So let's crank her up, see what we get. And we're right at 2.5. And just so we know that it's not the meter just being lazy, if we disconnect the wire, that needle goes way down, back down to 100 mega ohms, which basically means infinite resistance for all practical purposes. Hook up to 2.5 mega ohm again, and we come back up with 2.5 mega ohms. Okay, and this thing will also measure uh, smaller resistances directly, which is a pretty cool thing. This, uh, the, the, the other scale it has is from 0 to 10,000 ohms, which uh, pretty much stops right where the uh, mega ohm scale uh, starts up. So that's kind of a neat. Uh, on this resistor, it's going to probably read way off, uh, yeah, way off scale because it's just way out of range there. But if we go with a lower resistance, let's uh, let's put a like a hundred ohm resistor in there, and uh, we'll watch it read a hundred ohms. I'll be right back. So we have a 100 ohm resistor, and we're going to hook that to our little mega, mega meter thing. And 100 ohms will be right about there. We're reading the bottom scale now, so 100 ohms will be. 100 ohms should end up right about there. So here we go, crank her up, and there is our 100 ohm reading, nice and pretty. So this is a very accurate little mega. Doesn't require batteries or power. It's got its own little crank generator. If you want to use it as a stun gun, as long as the other guy will let you hook a couple clips up to him, you can uh, you can really send him for a loop. This thing will stun the heck out of a person. I'm not sure about its lethal ability. It is at a very low current. In fact, let's demonstrate that. You might freak out here. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate that how 500 volts cannot even light a 12 volt light bulb. So once again, let's uh, let's hook this thing up to our meter and make sure we're getting some good voltage out of it. 
Okay, let's uh, go back to a view of the meter real quick. All right, we're gonna put it in the volts. Uh, DC, it's already on DC. And we're gonna put it on the 2000 volt scale. It's the highest voltage scale. Okay, and we're just gonna crank this thing. Okay, I've got something wrong here, it looks like. Let's see, I got that hooked up, that hooked up. Okay, I have another wrong uh, setting on the thing. Okay, so we are putting out 540 volts. But it's at such a small current, that even though it can cause one heck of a sting to the human body, possibly even stop the heart, it's not enough to light even this little 12 volt lamp. So let's switch to a different view of this thing. Let's go to our view that we normally have for our unit under test. Here's our little light bulb. We're gonna hook our, let's see, we should be able to just snap that right around the whole perimeter. Alrighty, and then, let's stay in place. It will if I hold it. And as long as I'm only holding one side of the circuit, I won't get shocked. Okay, I'm only touching one side of the circuit. Okay, and now here we go. We're gonna crank this thing and probably won't even be able to light that light bulb. Okay, here we go. Nothing. Not even the slightest glow out of that. And, and we're getting a spark when we connect and disconnect the, the, the clip from the bulb. We're getting a little spark, but we're still not getting nearly enough to light that bulb. So let's try a six volt bulb. A six volt bulb, that's probably gonna take too much current too, but we'll try it just for fun. See if we can get just a little bit of a glow out of it. Okay, here we go with a six volt bulb. Nope, I'm not detecting even the slightest bit of a glow. Ooh, shit! But I got a one heck of a shock when I accidentally touch both uh, both things. Okay, so that just goes to show you, uh, it doesn't take shit for current to kill you. Uh, I just demonstrated that that hurt like hell. Uh, gave me a start, it made me cuss in front of camera and all the other kind of stuff. But it would not light the six volt bulb because this six volt bulb probably takes Oh, a few hundreds of an amps of current, and this probably doesn't even put forth a, a few thousands of an amps. So anyway, okay, so uh, that's all I really want to play with this thing for right now. You've just uh, seen me almost kill myself having a, a near-death experience. No, just kidding. It's getting shocked in this line of work is a daily thing. I'd feel guilty if I didn't get shocked. Alrighty, so, but anyway, so we've gone into some of the stuff about grounding, we've dispelled a few myths, we've, uh, we, we've uh, experienced a, a couple of phenomena that may have been a little bit surprising, and that was the only purpose. Uh, another, uh, another, just uh, another advancement in Barry's 8-track repair shop in an effort to be, uh, you know, the most equipped 8-track shop and uh, the most equipped classic car radio repair shop in the entire world, and I think we've pretty much gone overkill on that, but doesn't keep me from still wanting to keep expanding and, uh, and offering better service and uh, having everything I could possibly ever need to perform any tests I would ever need to perform. So uh, that being stated, if you'd like to send your things to the mad scientist to have me p poke around in it, uh, you can reach me, you can reach my recorded message, which will turn you on to my websites at 928-533-9666. My main website, the one that's really complex and, and uh, elaborate, is in the description below. Thank you very much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.